by a show of hands, how many of you, if you are parents or maybe you, you know, lead or pour into people who are younger than you or younger spiritually than you, how many of you know that just kind of being that parental disciple or figure in somebody's life is pretty much just trial and error, right? Like anybody realize, it's just a bunch of trial and error, like that didn't work, try something else. Well, that is one of the first things I learned as a parent. This is totally going to be trial and error. My poor, poor firstborn Avery, she was the guinea pig, right? But the deal is, and one of the things that's really cool is that you know, as parents, Colleen and I have gotten some things right, and there's some things that we get to do uh, that we get to rejoice in. Like, hey, this is a really cool opportunity as a parent to get to do this. And one of those for me personally is since I work out of the house, and since Colleen's work hours are usually from about 6 a.m. to 10 a.m., sometimes 5.30 a.m. to about 10 a.m., so she, her alarm clock's going off at like 4.20 in the morning some morning, so pray for her. But, uh, but I get up. And I have the opportunities now on Tuesdays and Thursdays to get those girls out of bed and take them to school. And that's a really cool thing for me as a dad. Like, I know a lot of people, they don't have that opportunity. And so I get to rejoice in the fact that as a dad, that's a cool thing to get to do. That's something I'll get to remember even if the girls don't. But even simultaneously while I'm rejoicing in that, there's also a little bit of room for reform in the getting the kids to school process. Because... Because I like to stay up late with my kids. In other words, like Hadley's getting put to bed about 9.15 and Avery's closer to 10 o'clock. So like they sleep late. If we let them, there was one morning, Colleen came home from work at 9.45 and Avery was still asleep. I got to talk into him about how that isn't appropriate. And I was like, but she's sleeping and I'm getting work done. It's fantastic. But the problem is on those mornings, I'll wake them up for school at 9 o'clock. About 8.35. So I'm like, I think it's probably time to get the girls out of bed, right? And so I get them out of bed, and as soon as I get them out of bed, even though I get to rejoice in the fact I get to take them to school, I get them out of bed, and it's like, come on, go, 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 down those yogurts. I'm getting them yogurt tubes and just squirting them into their mouth. I'm like, doing that in the back of the car, just throwing protein bars at them. Here, eat this. Oh, I forgot to put a diaper on you. We'll fix that when we get to school. You know, it's just one of those, like, 20 minutes of pure chaos trying to get them from the bed, fed, dressed, and off to school. And it throws everything off if Colleen didn't pick out the clothes the night before. Because I just stare at these closets and I'm just like, what do I put them in? Like, it's just so many options. And then, do they match? I'm asking Avery if they match. And she's like, no. And I'm like, oh no. So, I mean, just constantly. And so, as I look at this, this event that happens on Tuesdays and Thursday mornings, I see an opportunity to rejoice and then I'm looking at this and I'm going, hey, I get to take my kids to school while simultaneously seeing an opportunity to reform, right? And those two things aren't mutually exclusive. We can look at our own lives, at the lives of others, at our church, at larger institutions, and see reasons why simultaneously we can rejoice and we can reform. See, that's what I want to talk about today. Um, because I think the Christian understanding the Bible should understand these concepts that we're talking about. And I think most of you probably do. You might have heard the phrase, somebody say this, I'm not where I want to be, but I'm certainly not where I was. See, that phrase encompasses what I'm talking about, the idea that we can rejoice that we aren't where we were, but we still want to reform because we're not where we want to be. See, Christians understand something. They understand why the world's broken. If you got a room full of 100 people, I think 99.9% .9 of those people, so you've got like a, a nine-tenths of one person disagreeing, but like you, you, they would say, yes, the world is broken. It's not as it should be. But Christians understand clearer than most why that is, and it's because of sin. Genesis 1 and 2, God's perfect world. Genesis 3, we rebel against God and everything breaks. That's why we all know the world's broken, even though we've never seen the world perfect. Have you ever thought about that? Like, how do you know that something isn't the way it should be if you've never seen the way that it should be? I believe it's because God's written on our heart the way things should be, and then we look around and we see the way that things actually are, and we know there's a disconnect. So we understand that there are constant <coughs> reasons to change and to mold and to shape. And I'm not just talking culture at large. I'm talking about me. Right? right? Like, let's get this down to an individual level. I'm looking at the person in the mirror, and I'm going... You certainly aren't where you need to be. And we understand that's because of sin. But simultaneously, the Christian understands that Jesus did something 2,000 years ago that changed the world. 
he began the process of fixing God's broken world. He began the process, and in many of our own lives, we can point back to a time or a season in our life where God saved us and changed us and gave us a new heart. So we certainly aren't where we want to be, but we aren't where we were, and we have reason to rejoice while simultaneously seeing we have reason to change, to grow, to conform, to be more like Jesus, to reform. And what I want to do, this is kind of like an extra week for me, because as we planned this out, this was supposed to be Greenbrier Week, we pushed that back a week, so I've just got this extra week to preach on something that's in my heart. So I want us to go to Matthew 16, verses 15 through 27, Matthew 16, verses 15 through 27, and we're going to see the Apostle Peter, Peter confessing Jesus, leading the early church, wrote some books of the Bible, changed the world. We're going to see Peter. And we're going to see in this passage that Jesus simultaneously rejoices in something that happens to Peter and then calls on Peter to reform something that happens. And it's, pretty, it's, it's a pretty stark contrast. Uh, just spoiler alert, Jesus is going to call Peter Satan. Like, you think that kind of sticks with you a little bit. If, like, the creator of the world, like, that's the rebuke you get. But we're going to see that Peter does something awesome and then needs to reform. We're going to pick that apart because I think as a church culture, if we begin to get this, we actually can engage the world the way that Jesus would have us engage the world. I think we can engage our neighbors the way that Jesus would have us engage our neighbors. If we are simultaneously looking in people's lives and looking for the reason to be encouraged while also looking for the reason to say, hey, you aren't where you need to be in this. If we could bring both of those things to the table. Instead of just bringing the, well, you stink at this, and you stink at this, and you stink at this, or being like the rainbow puking unicorn where everything is great, and the, you know, the sky's falling, but no, this is fantastic. This is just another opportunity. If we don't kind of let ourselves fall into either of those traps, we can truly see God do an amazing work. Now, let me give you a quick heads up just as far as letting us know where we're going uh, in the next couple of weeks. Because like I said, this week we're in Matthew chapter 16. Um, next week, what we're going to do, Greenbrier is going to be here, and I'm going to combine the two messages I preached from the prodigal son about six weeks ago. I'm going to make those into one, and that's going to be the message that's going to be preached in here. And the reason I'm doing that is because most of you, in some capacity, will be running around helping to make Sunday happen. So I want you all to have already heard a lot of going to be preached so that you don't feel like you're, you're missing out. And that's an awesome opportunity for us to tell our friends that are coming about the prodigal son. And then the week after that, we're going to start the book of 1 John. So we're going to start working. We haven't worked through a book since the book of Mark, and we spent like 72 years in the book of Mark. <laughs> so we took some time off, but now we're going to look at the book of 1 John. It's going to be a lot of fun. I want you guys to be excited about that. You can also start reading ahead because there's some really awesome stuff in there. But to launch us off into what we're going to look at, I want you to see why this is important. I brought with me um, an illustration device. My old blockbuster <laughs> card. So I actually have two of these in my desk drawer. I don't know why. This was issued on uh, March 11th, 2005. I was about to graduate high school. And blockbuster was the jam, right? Like, you needed, a, you needed entertainment for a Friday or Saturday night. What'd you do? You go peruse the aisles of Blockbuster, and you're reading the back of the cases. Do y'all remember, like, before the DVDs, the VHSs, like, Be Kind, Rewind, and they had, like, the, the super speedy rewind tools, and you got fined if you didn't rewind when you brought it back? Oh, man, great memories. But there's a story floating around um, that Netflix, many of y'all, your subscribers to Netflix, it's the streaming movie service that stream, you can stream all sorts of stuff. They brought their business model to Blockbuster. And they said, look, things are moving online. Things are moving towards the internet. The brick and mortar thing that you've got going on where you go into a store and you rent DVDs, like that's going to be obsolete soon. People are going to be able to sit on their couch and do what they do in your store, and they're going to pay to do it that way. And Netflix was like, we want to take your branding, and we want to take your you know, knowledge of distributing videos and distributing movies, and we want to take it online. And they laughed at them. They were like, no, that's not good. We're fine. We're great. And now we laugh when somebody pulls out a Blockbuster card, and many of us are subscribers to Netflix. Now, here's why that's important. I don't think the problem with most people 
or most companies. Like if you're looking at a company or a church and you see this church over here that's growing and reaching people and then you see this church over here that's not growing and they seem to be shrinking and there's a lot of fighting, I don't think the difference between these two churches is the fact that this one needs to reform and this one doesn't. I think it's that this one that's growing is willing to reform, is willing to change, and is willing to constantly ask the question, how can we reach people better while this one refuses to change? And I think the same is true with individuals. If you've got an individual that's growing in Christ and changing and sharing their faith and excited about Jesus, and then you've got somebody over here who's been stagnant for decades, doesn't seem to care, it's kind of crusty about their faith, I don't think you're looking at two individuals and one of them doesn't need to change and the other one doesn't. I think it's that the one who's growing is willing to change and the other one isn't. Now let me call time out. I'm not talking about changing theologically. Like I'm not about to, oh, I think the Bible, I've decoded it and this is a totally, I'm not talking about that. Like the gospel is the gospel. Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. We're, we don't change the word of God, but we see over time the way we tell people the gospel, the way we do church, the way we are the church and embrace the community. Those things should be constantly changing, especially in light of our rapidly changing culture. As should we be constantly changing. Like, we should look back over the past couple of years that we've been following Jesus and see that there are things that we used to do, used to indulge in, used to give ourselves over to, and we don't. And maybe there's areas of obedience that we are actually walking in, whereas in two, three years ago, we weren't walking in them. We should be constantly seeing Jesus conform us to his likeness, while also recognizing there's so many reasons to rejoice. There's so many reasons to rejoice, and one of them is the fact that he is changing us into his likeness. So, with all that being said, let's get to our first point, which is this, rejoice. I know, shocking, right? Rejoice. Um, so, this will come as a shock to most of you, but I hate dressing up. <laughs> I, I hate dressing up. In fact, one of my one of one day my dream is just to preach in my workout clothes. Like I just want to. I got to. I loved going down to the beach with Ridgeway Baptist a couple months ago, and one of the reasons was because Josh just let me preach in the workout clothes. I was just like, man, this is the best gig ever at the beach preaching to high schoolers about Jesus wearing the uniform, right? Like that's just how I roll. But to be honest, like I don't mind putting on jeans and a collar shirt. Like it's not the end of the world. But putting on a tie, putting on a tie. No, no, no. I'm just like, no, I don't. It's like, like, I just can't. Some of you, you're like, I want to look as dressed up as possible. No, I want to push the envelope for how undressed up I can be and still be led into your establishment. Like, that's the goal. But, but what will happen is I'll go to, exactly, I'll go to, uh, I'll go to like a, a wedding or a rehearsal dinner. And what I'll do is I won't know what the attire is supposed to be. So I'll dress up, and I'll put the khakis on, and the button up, and I'll even put the tie around, but I'll leave it loose, because as soon as that thing gets tightened, it's just like, I can't breathe. You know, like, I've just kind of got one of those going on. I had, like, a, like, an extender for the buttons, so my neck would pop out a little bit, but I lost it. So I'm back to, you know, like, sound like Darth Vader when I'm wearing one of those suckers. But I will sit in the car for about two or three minutes, and I'll watch people walk in. I'll be like, he doesn't have a tie. He does have a tie. He has a coat, but no tie. And I'm sizing everybody up. And what I'm doing is I'm looking to see, is it appropriate to leave the tie in the car? And you have to do a little bit of light. You've got to watch a couple people, because you don't want to see the one outlier, like the crazy uncle who's been drunk since 8 AM and excited about the rehearsal dinner. You know, if he doesn't have a tie on, that might not be the best person to go for. But you know, if you see a couple people, it's like, OK, good. But what I'm doing in there is I'm looking at other people trying to get my cues for how I should operate within this setting. Now, when it comes to us as Christians, if we are looking for reasons to rejoice and we're looking for reasons to encourage, we should look to Jesus and see what he rejoiced in, what he was encouraging about. So I want to read a couple of passages of scripture. I know I told you I'll turn to Matthew 16, but we got to look at Luke 15 real quick. Jesus is telling some stories. This is actually the two stories that precede the story of the prodigal son. So Jesus talks about, he talks about a lost sheep and a shepherd who goes to find the sheep. And this is how he sums up the story. He says, Luke 15, 6 through 7, he says, And when he, the shepherd, comes home, he calls together his friends and his neighbors, saying to them, there's our word, rejoice with me, for I found my sheep that was lost. Just so, I tell you, there will be, mit, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who need no repentance. So what did Jesus just say there? He said, rejoicing is happening in heaven. 
and someone gives their life to Jesus. But just in case you missed it, let's go verse 8. Or what woman, having ten silver coins, if she loses one coin, does not light a lamp and sweep the house and seek diligently until she finds it? And when she has found it, she calls together her friends and neighbors, saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found the coin that I have lost. Just so I tell you, there is more joy before the angels of God over one sinner who repents. Rejoice with me. I found what was lost. There is joy in heaven. So if we're looking for Christians as reasons to rejoice, I think one of the baseline reasons to rejoice is when we see somebody who has given their life to Jesus. Like if we see somebody who has crossed from death to life, who has said, yes, I want to follow Jesus, whereas before they were like, no, I don't want to follow Jesus. When we see that happens, that is reason for us to lose our minds. Like, I want us to be a church that celebrates that. When we do baptisms, and that is a symbol of this taking place, baptism doesn't save you, but it's a, a symbol of the fact you have given your life to Jesus. When we do those and people are willing to go forward and say, yes, I've given my life to Jesus, that should be one of those high watermark moments for us as a church. Where we are just like, this is awesome. This is why we're here. This is what we celebrate. Because we see that there is a joy in front of the angels in heaven when that happens. See, that's a great place to get our cue, and we see Jesus live this out. Look with me at Matthew chapter 16, verses 15 through 17. This is our text. He's talking to his disciples, and Peter oftentimes is seen as the spokesman for the disciples. So he asks the disciples, he says, hey, who does everybody say that I am? He's just kind of giving them a quiz and talking to them, and they're like, well, some say you're Elijah, and some say you're John the Baptist, and some say this and that and the other thing. And then Jesus says this in verse 15. He said to them, but who do you say that I am? Simon Peter replied, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. Notice the exclamation point. Now, as somebody who overuses exclamation points in text messages, you probably gotten one from me and felt like I was screaming at you, so I apologize for that. But like when you see the Bible deliberately use an exclamation point, Jesus right here is like... Boom! He's like, this is right. You got it right. This is worth celebrating. This is worth getting excited over. And so we as a church, the past two weeks, I'll mention this in a couple of minutes. The past two weeks we talked about the things we value. How we're a church that values being intentional and generosity and service and being multi-ethnic and being a place where we're, we're clarifying and it's a safe place. All of these things that we value. We want to value people giving their life to Jesus. And what Jesus is celebrating right here is that God has done a work in Peter's heart where Peter is able to see this, that this man who has opened the eyes of the blind, who has opened the ears of the deaf, and who have allowed the lame to walk, who have, who's done all of these things, Peter sees he is the Christ, the awaited one, the, people that, the, the person that the people of Israel have been waiting on. And Jesus celebrates that. And see, if we become a church and we become a people who are willing to celebrate that, on some base level, we can put aside the differences that separate denominations and cause oftentimes church infighting, right? Like if we find people who are like, the Bible is God's word and Jesus is my savior and he's changing me and I know I'm a sinner and I need a savior. You find somebody who says that and you find that they disagree with you about the trichotomy and the dichotomy of the spirit. Some of you are like, what did you just say? We'll talk afterwards. If you find somebody who disagrees with you on like a big theological issue that people have been deba debating for hundreds of years, it's like, hey, it's okay. We can agree to disagree because we both know Jesus. And I'm not saying that those open-handed issues aren't important. We talk about them because they are important. But first and foremost, we want to look at churches outside of this church who are spreading the gospel and applaud them even if there are some differences. For instance, I love my Presbyterian brothers and sisters in Christ. But when they do baptism, they sprinkle. When we do baptism, we dunk. And I've got a really great argument for why we do that from Scripture. But I'm not going to look at them and be like, well, I know you're preaching the gospel and people are meeting Jesus in your church and you're doing awesome things, but we just need to yell about that. No, 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 that's not a great starting point at all. <clears throat> and so as a church, I want us to first and foremost hold that highly. See, one of the things that I like to do, and I've been spending a lot of time intentionally doing this, I like to meet with leaders, like people who are leading things. Because I'm trying to figure out, like, to talk about being a parent is trial and error, being a pastor and leading, 
lots of trial and error here. And I thank y'all for allowing me to, to figure this out as we go on the fly. But what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to be a better leader as God has called me to lead. But I'll meet with leaders who we've got some disagreements on some theological issues. But I look at their life and I look at the fact that God has given them this grace of, of being able to lead. And I'll ask them questions. And I'll be like, hey, how do you handle this? How do you navigate that? And they might tell me stuff and I'm like, no, that doesn't line up with what I believe. But that doesn't mean that everything that they say isn't helpful. It doesn't mean that God's grace isn't working in their life in every area. See, I... I one of the things that I've seen myself doing, and maybe you've done this too, is somebody, will, you'll, you'll be reading somebody or listening to somebody, and you'll want to tell somebody else about that person, but like the first thing out of your mouth is, well, I don't agree with Jason about this, 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 and this, but you really ought to listen to him. It's like, well, you just told me all the reasons not to. And so some of us, we always feel like we have to qualify everything that way. But see, what I want to do is I want to find common ground, especially with people who know Jesus. And then that allows us to have the conversations where we can both grow and we can challenge each other and we can discuss <laughs> the open-handed issues in love. Because see, if we always just jump to, well, that church, and that, da, da, we're never going to get anywhere. And I think that's what characterized the church in the latter decades of the 20th century. There was so much fighting amongst everybody who, all, at the end of the day, they all loved Jesus, and the issues they were fighting about were important, but the world saw that, and they were like, well, I don't want to get in the middle of their family drama, right? So as a church, what we want to do is ultimately look and see that Jesus was encouraged that Peter got this right, even though Peter's about to get something completely wrong. Now, let's keep going, because we're not done with, with rejoice, and then we'll get to reform. Don't worry, I know some of you are like, but there are things to reform. I know we're going to get there. But let's look at verse 18. Jesus says, And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Now, let, let's just do a quick theological side note. And if you want to talk about this afterwards, I'd love to. I've done a lot of reading and studying about this. But I do not believe that right here Jesus is making Peter the first pope. I don't believe that. Now, if you come from a Catholic background, this is the text that, that is used to justify that argument. But I don't believe that's what Jesus is saying. If you study the Greek, what you see is that Jesus is emphasizing the statement that Peter made, where Peter said, you are the Christ. He's not emphasizing Peter. And he's saying that on that confession and on men and women who have made that confession, I will build my church. And he has. That's what he's doing here today. And when he says, whatever you bind on, on earth will be bound on earth, what Jesus is saying right there is as you preach the gospel and preach the word, you're binding and you're loosening by preaching my word. And if you look at the totality of scripture and you look at the totality of Peter's life, that's what you see play out. Now, once again, if you have theological questions about that, see me afterwards. Love to discuss it. It would be fun. We'll stay here till about 2 or 3 in the afternoon and we'll discuss it. Um, but the thing I don't want us to lose sight of, and when we have those dense theological discussions about this, we oftentimes miss the forest for the trees. Because right here, Jesus goes straight encouragement. Doesn't he? Guess what, Peter? You got it right, and the gates of hell are not going to prevail against this church when it starts to move forward and people start to confess this. That is awesome. And I think one of the things that is lacking in most of our lives one of the things that is lacking in most of our circles <clears throat> is encouragement, right? So many of us were guarded and our default mode is criticism and critique, and we never look for opportunities to encourage. We never look for opportunities to breathe life into people with a simple encouraging text message, phone call, or really just a statement or maybe even just a hug when you see them and say, hey, I want you to be encouraged about this. One of the things that it might be a secret that most ministers don't tell you, but there's really no filter here. Um, ministers so often get discouraged. Like most Sundays, it, it doesn't take me long to find something to go home and be discouraged about, just to be honest. And that's me saying that having a great church with awesome people. And I know many ministers, they're, they're discouraged, they feel lonely, they, they, they feel like, you know, all they hear is the criticism and the, you know, the infighting. And there was a Sunday, I was just feeling down about some stuff. And I had some people come up to me. I'll never forget this. I had some people come up to me. And they were just talking to me. And they were sharing their heart with me. And I was sharing my heart with them. And they realized, like, I just needed to be prayed for. They prayed for me right there. 
And one of the guys I was talking to, he just kept repeating over and over and over again, don't lose heart. Like, not in some creepy way where he's like, don't lose heart, don't lose, but like in a, an encouraging way. He was just like, hey, look, don't lose heart. Keep doing what you're doing. Don't lose heart. Don't lose heart. Don't lose heart. And I needed that. And honestly, that was wind in my sails for weeks. And the reason I say that is because you have no idea what a positive, like, I don't mean to sound like Caleb, but what a positive and encouraging comment can do for somebody. Where you truly just speak life and say, hey, I, I don't know what's going on, but I want you to know that the thing that you said or that time that you did that thing, it really meant a lot to me. You can do that over text message. And most of us are afraid to do that because we're insecure in who we are in Christ. And we're like, what will they think of me if I encourage them? Unless they're a masochist, they'll probably welcome it. Right? They'll probably be like, hey, thank you so much for the encouragement. So here's my question. Is there anyone in your life that when I say those things about encouragement that you think of that you're like, hey, I could fire off a text message to them and just say, hey, thanks for the prayers. Thanks for the time you did the thing that resulted in that. Thanks for being there for me. Thanks for being a light. Is there anybody you can think of? Because if that person's coming to mind right now, that most likely is the Holy Spirit. I don't think that's Satan being like, you should encourage them. I don't think that at all. So I would encourage you to encourage them. Let me give you a couple places where I think we can, we can flesh this out. First is within marriage. I said this a couple weeks ago, and people really leaned in, so I'll say it again. Um, when I'm doing premarital counseling with a couple, I'll sit down with them and I'll say, look, here's the, here's the goal. Here's the goal. I want you both to be open with each other about the things you see the other person struggling with, but I want you to focus on the reasons you should be encouraged by your spouse. So I want you to look at your husband or look at your wife and see all of the reasons that you see in them that God's working in them. And I want you to focus on your spouse's strengths while focusing on your own weaknesses. I want you to focus on your spouse's strengths while focusing on your own weaknesses. And if you're rejoicing in your spouse's strengths while reforming your own weaknesses and both parties within the marriage are doing that, you'll see a place that is truly edifying developed within your marriage. Because what do we do? We do the reverse. You see all the things that your spouse does that's wrong, and you see all the things that you do that's right. But it's, if we flip that and we practice encouragement and rejoicing within marriage, we'll see God move. Another area is this. One of the things I've seen, is this, I guess this is a 21st century phenomenon because Facebook didn't exist before then, um, but when someone will pass away, and they have a Facebook account. So many people will get on their Facebook account and they'll write all of these encouraging things about that person. Man, you meant so much to me when I did when you did this, and meant some, and I've seen it happen. And I think that's right and good. There's nothing wrong with that. But the thing that makes me sad is that there's probably people who are writing those things on that person's profile who never actually said those things to that person while they were still here. And so what we need to practice, I mean, we should honor people, absolutely. I'm not saying it's wrong to get up at a memorial service and say this person was awesome and here's why. But what I am saying is before the memorial service, while they're still here, look for opportunities to encourage them and strengthen them in the Lord. Because it will make it so much easier if they know that you love them and they know that you care. And if they're a Christian, they know that you celebrate because they know Jesus. It will make it so much easier for them to listen to you when you have to talk about the report. If you lead with the encouragement and you lead with the, hey, I love you, they'll listen to you when you talk about the reforms. I've heard it said this way, they don't care what you know until they know that you care. Right? Like we've said that before. So look at verse 20 real quick. Matthew 16, verse 20. Jesus says this. Then he strictly charged the disciples to tell no, no one that he was the Christ. Okay, that's bizarre. Because like, if you look at the scriptures later on in, in Matthew, he says in verse 28, go tell everybody that I'm the Christ, right? The Great Commission. So why does Jesus do this? Jesus does this because he knows that there is a need for number two, reform. Number two, reform. Okay, so this will be reviewed for the five people that were here last week. But, um, <laughs> no joke. Uh, but we went through some of our church's values. And one of the things that we rejoiced in as a church <coughs> is that it's not just from the pulpit or from whatever this wooden box that I stand on, that these values are being expressed. But it's from our body. It's from the church. I mean, here's how I know this. Uh, last time that Greenbrier came on June 26, uh, <clears throat> most of the people that came, 17 out of the 25, I believe, was the number, they weren't in this room. 
They were hanging out in childcare. They were hanging out with y'all. They weren't hanging out with me. But most of them, when they left, I got the impression that they couldn't wait to come back. And why is that? I believe that's because they saw a church that wanted to serve them, wanted to love them, wanted to embrace them, wanted to, to cross barriers for them, and wanted to create a safe place that was a clarifying place in which we seek to see life change, all those things we talked about the past two weeks. I believe that when they came here, they saw that and they experienced that not from me, but from you, which means we get this. That's reason to rejoice right there. But at 6 p.m. tonight, before the uh, game night that we're having at my house, we're having a child care meeting. And the reason we're having a child care meeting is because we want to not only rejoice in the fact we're creating this culture where children want to be a part of this, absolutely yes and amen, but we also recognize we still got to reform some stuff because if we're going to grow, we've got to change a couple things. So simultaneously, what are we doing? We're rejoicing in what God's doing. We're reforming so that we continue to improve on what God is doing. And we see Jesus do this as well. Because Jesus not only encourages us, right? He's the God of all encouragement. Paul writes, but also we see Jesus right here calling Peter to reform. And it's a strong call. Let's just be honest, because let's look at verses 21 and 22. Uh, from that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and the chief priests and scribes and be killed, and on the third day be raised. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, Far be it from you, Lord, this shall never happen. Oh, our boy Peter. Here's, here's the problem with Pete here. Um, Peter has in his mind all of the Old Testament passages about the Messiah where he's going to open the eyes of the blind and open the ears of the mute and change the world. But he's not thinking about passages like Isaiah 53 where we see the Messiah suffering. See, no one in that time put those two passages together. Nobody thought that the same guy who was going to open the eyes of the blind would also be having his beard plucked out. Nobody was looking at those prophecies as if they were the same person. So Peter is confused when Jesus is like, you just confessed me as the Christ, and I'm heading to Jerusalem to be crucified. So Peter's like, no, you're not going to do that. And I love that because Peter's like, you're God, and you can't do this. And that's the attitude most of us have. Uh, but Jesus, it's time to reform. But he turned to Peter and said, get behind me, Satan. You are a hindrance for me, for you are not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of men. Man, Peter just got called Satan by Jesus. Now let me just ask a quick question. Why is that in the Bible unless it's true? So like if, if Peter's the leader of the early church, and this is all propaganda, like if we lived in North Korea and Kim Jong-un is like pushing all his propaganda, I don't think he's putting stuff like this in his propaganda. In the same way, I don't think Peter's putting this in the scriptures if Peter's the one inventing it. See, the most logical conclusion is the reason that Jesus calling Peter is in the scriptures is because Jesus really called Peter Satan. Like, that's, that's why it's there. And I believe that's one of the many reasons why we can actually trust our Bible. Now, if we can trust our Bible, what's our Bible teaching us? Well, what our Bible is teaching us right here is that Jesus simultaneously sees reasons to rejoice in Peter and then also tells him there's reason to reform. And like I said earlier, when we stop reforming, Something bad happens to us in our spiritual walk and in our growth as a church. Chelsea, you can actually go ahead and start playing that video. This is a video of a marathon in Lehigh Valley, Pennsylvania. You notice something weird about that marathon? A train, and there's a guy over there with a bike. I don't know what he was doing running the marathon on a bike. But what happened is this marathon, this was mile 7 of a 26.2 mile Boston qualifying marathon. And they got stuck for seven and a half minutes by this freight train. And could you imagine, like, you're running a marathon, you're trying to hit a time, you're getting all excited about it, and then this slow-moving freight train happens. And so I was watching this this weekend. They were talking about it, and I was thinking about this, and I was like, that is the perfect picture of what happens when Christians and churches refuse to grow, to change, and to be conformed into the image of Christ. We get stopped on our race by a train. Okay, you can stop showing that now. But I think that's helpful. Because that might be where some of you are today. That might be what some of you are struggling with today is you feel stagnation in your walk with Christ and you're looking around and you're going, why is this? And if you begin to search the depths of your heart, 
It might be because the God of all encouragement who loves you, who has saved you, and who's walking with you, has been pressing on an issue in your heart maybe for years that you need to give to him, but you refuse to do it. And you're like that person who was running the first seven miles of that marathon, and you get stopped by the train. And you haven't made any progress. And you're frustrated, and you're trying to move. See, here's... Here's the posture of the Christian. I'll, I'll illustrate it this way. ESPN Monday Night Countdown, football's back. Woohoo! Who's excited? Woohoo! Yeah! Okay, so football's back. ESPN Monday Night Countdown. They used to do a segment called Jacked Up. So the, so the segment was they took the biggest hits from the week, and then the announcers would show it, and then simultaneously, as the hit happens, they all go, He got jacked up! And there were all these hits, and you were like, Oh, that's crazy! And then about four years ago, the NFL began to admit that something was happening with the concussions and the brain injuries that were taking place. They were admitting that all of those hits that were celebrated as being jacked up were causing a condition in the brain that was causing neurological orders and disorders that were causing all sorts of players to experience symptoms like depression, suicidal thoughts, all sorts of brokenness was happening because of those jacked up hits. So over the past couple of years, what the NFL has tried to do, and I don't know how successful they've been, and there's been a lot of baggage surrounding this, but what the NFL has tried to do is try to actually begin to eliminate all of the hits that were once celebrated. Now, you can't eliminate all of those hits because football is football, but the point is simply this. What was once celebrated is now being tried to be eliminated. And like I said, you can't eliminate all of it, but some of it's still there, but it's not celebrated anymore. That's the posture that the Christian has towards sin. Before you give to life, your life to Jesus, you probably looked at sin and you were like, Oh man, that was awesome! Can you believe what we did? That was so great! Unless, of course, you like, you know, grew up in church and you struggled with legalism and you sniffed crayons and that was the worst thing you ever did. But on the other side, like those of us who kind of have a past, there was like, This is my baggage and this is awesome! And then we give our life to Jesus, and all of a sudden what we once celebrated, we no longer celebrate, we're actually trying to reform ourselves away from it. And we're not going to be completely successful at this until we go home to be with Jesus. But that's the posture that we take. And that's the posture that we all need to begin to have. So let me ask you the question. What is it that the Lord's been pressing on your heart? Like, I want you to know that if you're in this room and the Lord is even pressing on your heart, I'm encouraged by that. Praise God that he's working and praise God that you are an example that he refuses to give up on his children. However, what is it? What is that thing that you know you need to give to him? Maybe it's a sin proclivity, or maybe it's an obedience issue. He's asking you to start doing something, and you refuse to do it. What is it? See, I believe we need to begin to have this posture where we simultaneously feel encouraged by the fact that God's working on our heart, but we look for opportunities to be conformed to be more like him. And I think we should do this as a church. If we're looking at us as a church, remember, we're not a church because we meet in this building. We are the church because Jesus has saved us. That we, we, as the church, we exist for the world. We want to be agents of change. And as a body of believers, what are the things we should be encouraged by? And what are the things we need to continue to grow in? See, these are the hard questions that I want us to ask. And as the Christian, we have the ability to ask these things. Because we understand that we still live in a broken world. We're an institution made up of broken people who are being made more like Jesus because he loves us and because he has come to fix God's broken world. So simultaneously we rejoice and we repent. That's where we are as Christians. And we can do this all across the map. We can roll this out to institutions all over the world. We can look at you know, government, our country, our companies that we work in, and we can say, hey, there's reasons to rejoice and there's reasons to reform. And we hold those things together because they're not mutually exclusive. That's the posture that we need to have. But here's what I want to do as we wrap this up. I want to encourage us. I want to end on a note of encouragement because I know some of us, we might know exactly what we need to reform and we need the encouragement to do so. So here's how I want to end this. Uh, number three, the price of a soul. The price of a soul. Um, so a few weeks ago, I parted ways with an old family friend, the Green Demon. I, don't, I know most of you have heard that we sold the 2000 BMW 5 Series that contained so many memories. It's like a time capsule of memories. It was really like a time capsule. It just kind of had an odor, too. But uh, it's like stuck in there. It smelled like 2003. But... Um, 
But the deal was this car had 388,000 miles on it. My dad had given me, it to me about three years ago, four years ago. And I was like, here, you can have this car. It still runs great. I don't think I can get anything for it. And I'm like, cool, free car. So I drove it for a couple years. And then I went and bought a car because we're having three kids. And I had to figure out you know, how to get three car seats into something. Uh, and then we went out and bought a minivan. So we're really bought in now. But, uh, but the deal was, my, I told my dad, I was like, you can have the car back. And he's like, well, I really don't want it because it's just going to be expensive to fix. And it's going to take up space. And I was like, okay, so you want me to sell it? He's like, yeah, go for it. So, I put it on Craigslist, but here's the problem. You can't blue book a car with 388,000 miles on it. Like that's a trip and a half to the moon, right? <laughs> like to put them into perspective. So it's just like, how do you know how much it's worth? You don't search auto trader. It's like, you know, cars under 50,000 miles, cars over 350,000 miles. Like that's not an option when you're picking. So I was like, how am I gonna figure out how much this car's worth? So what I did was I said, okay, look, I'm just gonna put it at a price and we'll figure out what it's worth when someone pays something for it. Like that is the way to determine what it's worth. So some guy gave me like 1600 bucks for this car. And I thought that was great for a car that had that many miles, but I actually had it listed at about three times that much. And the guy calls me and he's like, hey, um, like the car, looks good. You're asking way too much. This is what I can give you. And I was like, well, you're the only person who's called me in the three weeks I've had it listed. And this is what you're offering me. That's probably what it's worth. And what I did there was I was actually able to determine what the car was worth. How? By seeing what somebody was willing to pay for it. I could have asked $75,000 for it, but that wouldn't have been what it was worth, right? really don't think that would have been what it was worth. But the reason I think that's illustration, that illustration is helpful is we can understand the concept that we see what something is worth by seeing what someone is willing to pay for it. We see what something is worth by seeing what someone is willing to pay for it. Keep that in mind because I want to read verses 24 through 26. There's a lot of teaching here we don't have time to get into. One day we will. But it says this, Jesus told his disciples, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul? Look at this last question. Or what shall a man give in return for his soul? See, Jesus, through his life, death, and resurrection, in a way, he answers that last question. Because he, he shows us what God is willing to give in return for our souls. See, I don't know about you, but some of the things that I struggle with, oftentimes I feel like I'm, I'm kind of worthless. I don't really have much value. I, especially on days where I don't feel like I'm getting where I want to be. I'm just like, why am I taking up space and <clears throat> oxygen on earth? Right? Like, I don't feel like I have much worth. Then I look at 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 18 through 19. It says this, Knowing that you were ransomed from the futile ways you inherited from your forefathers, look at this, not with perishable things such as silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb without blemish or spot. You want to know what your soul is worth? You want to know your value? You want to find something encouraging to rejoice in? that will propel you to reform and to leave the futile ways we inherited from our forefathers, look at the fact that Jesus was willing to ransom you to pay your debt, not with gold, not with silver, not with money, but with his own blood. See, that's the value you have in God's eyes. And when you realize that, how can you not be encouraged? How can you not, in the pits of your own struggles, where you're struggling with doubt, where you're struggling with questions, where you're struggling with belief, where you're struggling with sin, in the pit of all of those moments when you see that the reason that Jesus is in the pit with you is because he ransomed you with his blood, how can you not be encouraged to continue to conform to his likeness? And so we as a church, us as Christians, we come back to this every single time because this is the foundation of it all. This is why we reform, because we know that God loves us. We don't change and grow and mold into his image because we're trying to get him to love us. We change and mold and conform into his image because 2,000 years ago, he proved that he loved us on a bloodstained cross half a world away. And so here's my prayer for us as a church that we would be an encouraging place. 
that we would look to rejoice that people know Jesus and that God is working in this world and things might, not, might be bad, but they're certainly not as bad as they could be. His common grace is everywhere. He's changing lives. Let us find reasons to be an encouraging place, but in our encouragement, let's also encourage people to continue to reform and conform to the image of Christ. Let's pray. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, I thank you that 2,000 years ago you proved that you loved us by sending Jesus to die on the cross. And Jesus, I thank you that you have continued to pursue us even in our disobedient and even in our seasons of running from you. And so Lord, right now, I first pray that we would be encouraged to know that we are worth you giving your life for. I know that so many of us in this room, there are days and times that we feel worthless. We feel like nobody cares, nobody loves, nobody's pursuing, nobody engages, nobody would do anything for us because they don't see the value in us. I know that so many of us feel that way because I'm just confessing some of my own struggles. But Lord, when I look at that bloodstained cross 2,000 years ago, I see love. I see you declaring to us our value because our value is wrapped up in the price that someone is willing to pay for us and you ransomed us not with silver or gold but with your precious blood. Precious blood like that of a spotless lamb without blemish. Lord, would we first and foremost leave this place encouraged by that and from that encouragement, would you show us that anytime you're calling us to reform, anytime there's brokenness in our lives that we need to confess and repent of, or anytime that we theologically get a little off and you're calling us back to center, Lord, would you show us that you're doing that because you love us? How could we think that there is any other motivation behind you calling us to change other than love? we're looking at the cross. Lord, I pray that we would be a church that would constantly embody this. That we would rejoice in you and who you are and we would continue to conform and grow and change so that we could reach people. So that people would come in here and experience the same thing that Peter experienced that you rejoice in. And they would come in here and they would experience the same thing that Peter experienced where you rebuke and you conform. Those two things are not mutually exclusive. So, Lord, for the person in here who needs to be encouraging, show them how to do that. For the person in here who needs to change and grow, which is all of us, show us how to do that. Show us what our next step is. And, Lord, maybe for the person in here who's been trying to conform and reform on their own, trying to get you to love them, would you show them that they're... There is a reason to be encouraged, and it's not by their behavior, but it's by your behavior on the cross. Lord, would you open their hearts and allow them to give themselves to you? Just like, Lord, you showed Peter who Jesus was, would you be showing us that in our hearts this morning? Lord, thank you as we sing this song, this next song, we get to not only talk about the price that our soul is worth, but the fact that if you saved us, it's well with our soul. Our souls have been made right. You have even though the world might crumble around us, you fixed what's broken on the inside. And that is a preview of the fact that you will fix all of the reasons that there is that needs to be reformed. Lord, we love you and we thank you for all that you're doing. It's in Jesus' holy and precious name we pray. Amen. Y'all stand with me and we'll worship.